there seems to be a gap of understanding between the Western media and what's happening in Israel. Um, what's happening in the Middle East vis-a-vis -vis Israel. What do you think Western journalists are misrepresenting in their reportage? How many hours do you have? <laughs> look, I mean, I don't look at it in terms of pro or anti-Israel. I look at it in terms of accuracy. And the work that's done is, I mean, certainly a lot, there's a lot of good work done, but a lot of it's really terrible. And I think the crisis or issues that began with the Egyptian Revolution have been the worst covered story in the Middle East that I've ever seen. That even the most basic points of fact uh, weren't covered. To just to say that the Muslim Brotherhood is a radical organization which is anti-Semitic and anti-Western and does support terrorism, but not in Egypt, uh, and, and nothing could be more easy to prove. We have years of statements by Brotherhood leaders. We have their newspapers. I mean, we have ma a massive mountain of material. And all of the evidence is completely ignored. So, for example, if you have the head of the Brotherhood, the deputy head of the Brotherhood, and the former spokesman, who's now the representative in London, and you have other leaders saying, we are against the treaty with Israel, and we want to dissolve it, and then the media reports, no, they're not against the treaty. The media reports, they've abandoned, they've renounced violence. That's simply not true. And everybody knows it. They have re they renounced violence within Egypt because otherwise the government wouldn't let them function. But they openly have supported terrorism not only against Israel but also against the United States. So how is it, and this is only one of many examples, so how is it that there's no relationship between this reality and what's reported. And it's not just a matter, by the way, of the journalists. It's also a matter of the experts. Something very peculiar happened in, in the Egyptian crisis of upheaval, which is very few Middle East experts seem to be interviewed. And those that do are more, how can I put it, left partisan than they are academic. Even academics who are left partisan. And there's been an absence of expertise. And you hear people talking who don't know anything, who literally couldn't find the places on the map a week ago. And they say all sorts of absurd things. So I tried to come up with a list of factors. Why, why is this so? And uh, there are two underlying problems. One underlying problem is that, that ideology now runs much, much of the Western uh, newspapers and television. This was not like this 20 years ago or 15 years ago, or even 10 years ago. Anywhere near the extent to which it's true now. And secondly of all, that instead of all the news that's fit to print, it's all the news we feel like printing. So, for example, why is it that when there's a clear connection to radical Islamism, they leave it out. Why is it that they have to argue that the, that the Times Square bomber was upset because uh, he didn't keep up with his rent payments? Uh, and it's easy to say political correctness, but there's really something much more interesting and useful. It's that the, the journalists and the editors only report things which they think are good for you to know. In other words, and I've heard people say things like this, if you report the truth, then this will inspire, uh, it used to be Bush invading Iran, or people hating Muslims, or this kind of thing, so you don't report it. And this is not the way the media is supposed to work. So that's the, um, that's the foundation. The ideology and the, and the, the change, in, the, the departure from professional ethics to simply deciding what, what is good for the public to know. On top of that, in reporting on the Middle East, there are a number of other factors. Uh, one factor is nothing that's said in Arabic is important. They never pay any attention to what's said in Arabic. I think everyone knows, for example, that the Muslim Brotherhood site in Arabic calls for wiping out Israel and hating the West and declaring jihad against America. And the English language site 
is kept very uh, moderate and mild. In fact, they even took off the organization's slogan and its symbol from the English language. But because anything in Arabic isn't important, then they pay no attention to it. Even though these journalists do have assistants, you know, who are native speakers of Arabic, so they can translate stuff. So that, that's one principle. Second principle then is that in general, they only talk nowadays to two kinds of people. They talk to urban, uh, middle class, English speakers who are, who are moderate, liberal, pro-democracy people. And they talk to urban, English, middle class Islamists who want to sell them that, uh, that these groups are not extreme. And so you get the combination of these two. Everybody wants democracy and nobody is extremist. And this is what the theme that's pervaded the discussion of, of these uh, issues. So they're very naive and superficial. And the thing is, if you go and interview somebody who's, who's probably upper middle class English speaker who has a computer and Facebook and all of these things, in Cairo, how many people in a population of almost 90 million fit that description? And I would say no more than 100,000 in the country. So to present that as the view of the whole country, and this is typical, and this is what's important, it's, it's just absurd. A lot of this stuff is just not logical. And because it's not logical and ridiculous, it's all the more they need to keep any alternative view out, because the alternative view would show within two or three minutes how wrong they are. For example, I'll just give a few examples. One example is, the Palestinian Authority has refused to negotiate seriously with Israel for over two years. It's a matter of record. And one can go through the whole chronology. And now they're following a strategy of going to the UN and trying to get a unilateral state without negotiating with Israel or making any compromise. So how can you compare that reality to saying that the Palestinians want peace and Israel doesn't? Not to mention the fact that no newspaper I'm ever aware of has ever published any or even discussed in any way the Israeli peace plan, uh, Israeli government peace plan of two years ago, which was very important. That's one example. Here's a second example. The idea that Syria can be pulled away from Iran and turned toward the West. Now this is absurd and I can give you a list of arguments to say, to show it, but I have seen dozens of op-ed pieces in different newspapers saying that this is true and I've hardly ever seen a single one on the other side. Uh, so there's no balance. What I was particularly outraged at is that the New York Times ran a, um, an op-ed piece by Tariq Ramadan saying that the Muslim Brotherhood, which was headed by his grandfather, was an anti-fascist organization. Now I'm working on a book on the history of German and Nazi relations with the Middle East. We have the German documents which record how much money the Muslim Brotherhood was paid by German military intelligence in the late 30s. So people are allowed to tell total lies and are not called on it. There's no balancing material. Um, we were told that there was no threat of Hezbollah taking over Lebanon until the very last moment when it did take over Lebanon. And then when it did take over Lebanon, we were told that this isn't anything to worry about. So there's point after point after point where we're systematically misinformed. Now, the, 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 the bottom line here is it's not hard to see where this stuff goes wrong. It's, it's, it's not hard to show it if one is given a fair opportunity. And that, as I said before, that's why one is not given a, a fair opportunity to, to show this. Because of the agenda. Well, the agenda, but because, the, because their political, their claims are so fragile. They are so easy to disprove. And therefore, and, and this is often true in academia as well, so they have to prevent people from hearing an opposing point of view, or they have to ridicule the opposing point of view uh, in order to make their arguments survive. I know a young man <clears throat> who I had high regard for, 
uh, was, I'll be a bit vague, but who's an expert in Islamism. We've had many discussions, and I know what he thinks. And he's now writing stuff which is totally opposed to what he told me. Over years, his views were, and, and things I saw that he wrote, and I can see it's to build his career. That if he writes what he thinks, and he knows this, that uh, he doesn't have a future and he won't get jobs. So this, m many, most people are careerists and opportunists. And so you don't necessarily need to convince everybody, you need to show them very graphically that if they want to have a future and get good jobs and be praised, then they should toe the line. And if they don't, they'll be ridiculed and shut out. A very effective tactic. Is this also the, the case for uh, journalists reporting in the Middle East, do you think? Um, I think so, and I could, I could, and I won't tell you some very pointed anecdotes about that. But I think in that case, most people, they all think the same thing. And when you're close to these things, you know, you, and you hear directly from people, their direct experiences, and I wrote about, you know, my experience with NPR, for example. And so they, and I, and you see the journalists at work, and so you know what really goes on behind the scenes. But the most important thing about the Middle East is not the media coverage of the Middle East, it's the realities of the Middle East. And that's what one should always focus on. One shouldn't get sidetracked, you know, by this, which is, the media issue is obsessive for a lot of people. And the problem is this, so the issue is that the central issue in the Middle East, and perhaps the most important issue of our time internationally, is the struggle for control of the region between three different groups, between the Islamists, the nationalists, Arab nationalists who have been dominating it, and the pro-democracy people. And I wrote a book uh, about the pro-democracy movement, and I analyzed its strengths and weaknesses. And it has huge problems. In, in putting over this argument to people. Even though I would argue that they are objectively correct, that the best way to deal with the region's problems, to improve living standards, to improve the quality of people's lives, to have peace and stability, would be to have democratic states. But there are incredible obstacles for them to sell this. And I could probably list 12 to 15 different points and you never hear about any of these. So this is part of the problem. So what are some of these points? Uh, not in any particular order. Number one, to convince someone to be a, a, a liberal, moderate, pro-democracy person, you have to teach them a great deal. Whereas the nationalists and Islamists have a very simple idea that can be grasped within one minute. Number two, that Islamism and nationalism are indigenous to the countries, to the culture, whereas this Western democracy is an import. And therefore, it's harder for people to comprehend, and it can be discredited as an import. Number three, the Islamists and the nationalists are very well organized and well financed. The democracy advocates aren't. The, the nationalists and the Islamists control huge numbers of newspapers and television stations and so on. And the, the pro-democracy, there's literally, with that, that in terms of newspapers that are actually published in the Middle East, there's literally not a single one that's a liberal, pro-democratic, pragmatic, moderate newspaper or television station. The closest you would come in terms of satellite television is Al Arabiya, which is run by the United Arab Emirates to counter Al Jazeera. And yet, Hillary Clinton is praising Al Jazeera, which is number one station, which is now run by Islamists, and not Al Arabiya, which is number two station, which is much more moderate. I mean, this is the kind of craziness, you know, that people get into. Uh, but as I say, there are to continue with the list of problems the, I'll call them liberals or pro-democratic people have. One other problem they have is one of the reasons why national, one of the reasons why pro-democracy movements succeeded in Central Europe was because they had those two potent weapons on their side, nationalism and religion. If we look at Poland, Solidarity had Polish nationalism against the Soviets and they had the Catholic Church. So these are two very powerful things. But in the Middle East, 
both religion and nationalism oppose the pragmatic viewpoint. So that's a, just a tremendous uh, uh, problem. As of this moment, there's literally not a, there's literally not a moderate democratic party uh, from Morocco to, you know, Iraq. Uh, that's not completely true. There, there is in Kuwait. There are arguably, you could argue in Iraq, although they have a sectarian base. But there just aren't very many. And even in Egypt, we see that the quote, pro-democratic movement is, a, is an alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood and is very dependent on the Muslim Brotherhood. And these things are not a secret. I mean, Mohammed al-Baradei, who is now going to be the kind of democratic slash Muslim Brotherhood candidate for president, uh, has called for abrogating the peace treaty with Israel, and yet we're told he hasn't. And um, he's very close to the Islamists. The, the main, um, the main uh, kafaya, the main, before the current situation, the main pro-democratic group, you know, was largely taken over by radicals. And in fact, it had its, it, it, as its head until his death, one of the leading anti-Semites in Egypt, which, you know, to be the, one of the leading anti-Semites in Egypt, you've got to be pretty good at it. Um, so there's just a, a lot of material, a lot of problems, a lot of issues that aren't presented to, uh, to people. Even, I mean, I did research, for example, here's a simple question. The Egyptian revolution was begun by the April 6th movement. To my knowledge, no mass media um, institution has done a research report on the April 6th movement. And so I did, and what I found out was that of the four or five organized, although there are definitely pro-democratic, independent people, Facebook type, liberal types, the, the four organized groups, or five organized groups, that participate in the April 6th movement included uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood members, but as individuals because they had to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood that it wouldn't try to infiltrate, more moderate Islamists, uh, and um, members of two leftist uh, uh, anti-American uh, political parties. I mean, this is, it's not hard to find out this material. And the April 6th movement signed up for a coalition which rejected the peace treaty with Israel. Uh, and, and so, but these things are just not reported. People aren't aware of them. Uh, I, f this started for me last October 7th when I wrote an article entitled, The Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood Has Declared Jihad on America, Will Anyone in America Notice? And the answer is no, no one in America noticed. And it was a speech by uh, Muhammad al-Badi, al who was the relatively new head of the Muslim Brotherhood. And this speech was an amazing speech to me because in many ways he sounded like Osama bin Laden. He said jihad against the West, against the U.S. is, is a duty. America is going to collapse. It was a very hard line speech, even by brotherhood standards. So I pointed this out and I said, clearly, they see that the regime is weakening and they're changing their tactics. And nobody reported on, on the speech. A memory, I think, memory translated it. And, th and then we see what happens a few months later. And even now, you can't get people to understand the extremism of, of, of this group and what it stands for. So it's just amazing to me, and given the bulk of evidence on this point.